and welcome to the Bethel Church Podcast, located in the heart of the Black Hills. Our focus is to live, grow, love, and serve for the sole purpose to make Jesus known. Today I was craving a steak and I had to go get one. I got family out of town. I am a bachelor for the next two or three weeks and I'm going to eat anything I want to eat. Amen? So my belly became my God yesterday. I'm just kidding. I just took that way out of context. Sorry. They glory in their shame. Their values are upside down. Their worship is disordered. That was what he's speaking of when he says their God is their belly. Here are people who are living for their self. They are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Their worship is all messed up. It's all wrong. And so when he says their God is their belly, he's describing this area of their life that is all messed up, that needs to get in order. And that is the area of worship. In contrast to that, in verse 20, he says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's worshiping. That's what he's worshiping. That's where his worship is focused. He's already said this in Philippians 3.3 when he says that worship by the Spirit of God and we boast in Jesus Christ, we glory in Christ Jesus. So the question is, when we live our lives, because, hey, one of our values, worship is our passion. That's not talking about Sunday mornings playing a bunch of instruments and singing. By the way, give it up for our worship team. They, they're incredible. But listen, that's not all worship is. That is a portion of worship. The rest of worship takes place from Monday morning until Saturday. And then Sunday we come here to get filled up. And our worship should be an overflow of what God's done in our life for the rest of the week. That's what Sundays are. We come and we get refilled, we get empowered so that we can go out, we can go in our weeks, and we can win people to Jesus and we can live a lifestyle of worship. So we have to look at what our desire is. Where's our our hunger at? What do we want? What do we desire? Contrast with those whose glory is in their shame. Do you govern your appetites or are you governed by them? And is your desire set on Jesus Christ? Is he the source of your joy? These are things that we have to look at and we have to ask ourselves. Where's the source of our joy? If life is terrible, if life is just throwing you a curveball right now that you can't hit, Is the source of your joy found in what is happening in the physical realm, or is it found in what God's doing inside of you? Where's your joy? Where's the source of it at? Because we can all, listen, I'm going to break some news to you right now that's going to devastate some people. Life is not always easy. Right? Is everybody blown away? Life is not always easy. But here's the thing. God never promised it was going to be easy. I hate hearing preachers say, hey, listen, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Does he? He said they hated me, they're going to hate you too. Doesn't sound too wonderful to me. But what he does say is, I will sustain you. The power of God, the same power that rose Christ from the dead lives inside of you so you can walk through the pains of life with joy that comes from the Lord and nothing else. We can still do that. So we have to govern our appetites. What Paul is saying here in this passage is that those, for those whose citizenship is in heaven, the king of heaven, in Christ Jesus, the king of glory, Christ is their desire. It's his, he is their reward. Christ is their prize. It is Christ that they worship in everything. Not just Sunday morning singing. It's our lifestyle. Is our lifestyle worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Now that's hard because we have that, that forces us to take a very strict inventory of our life. Now I'm not saying you can't have fun, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying what you do should reflect the joy of the Lord inside of you. What you do and how you behave should reflect worship to Christ. We have to remember that Paul is writing to the believers in Philippi, um, and and Philippi was actually a a colony of Rome, so this is interesting. So when Paul says that we're citizens of heaven, when he makes that comment, our citizenship is in heaven, that's that's what he's saying. This really could have landed with them, all right, because if you, I'm a big context guy, I love context. You have to look at context in scripture, because if not, I can pull any scripture in the Bible out and make it beneficial for me. 
We can do that. We can take any scripture out of context. But here's the thing. When Paul is speaking, he's speaking to the people he's writing to. Now, we take this and we apply this stuff to our life, but he's speaking to a certain group of people. And when he speaks to someone, it resonates with where they are. So when he says that we are citizens of heaven, uh, it, would have, it would have stuck with them. Because as people who lived in Macedonia, which is about 800 miles from Rome, they lived as Roman citizens in a Grecian Macedonian area. Okay, so they were citizens of Rome, but they were living in a different area. You see what I'm saying? You see where Paul's contrasting? You see what he's doing here? We live on earth, but we're citizens of heaven. So he's saying this because they would understand what he's saying because, oh, wait a minute, I'm a, it's like being a citizen of Canada but living in America. You see, you know what I mean? And so he's saying you're, you're citizens of heaven, although you live here. So what that meant is that they had Roman laws. We know from archaeology that even their legal documents were written in Latin, not Greek. Paul spoke in a lot of Greek. They addressed like Romans. They had Roman architecture. They were trying to bring a little bit of Rome into Philippi because their citizenship was in Rome even though they lived in Philippi. Okay, So they're blending this stuff together. It's a great picture of the Christian life, to be honest whose citizenship is in heaven, but we live here on earth. Our ambition, our goal is to bring a little bit of heaven to earth so that we have this alternate city, this colony of heaven. That's what the church is called to be. Now, wait a minute. I just said something that some of you might have thought, wait a minute, what's he, what is he talking about bringing heaven to earth? What do you think revival is? What do you think healing is? What do you think a move of the Spirit of God in churches is? What do you think that uh, being filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit is? What do you think that is? It's a little bit of heaven on earth. Why is that important? Because what does God say in the book of Jude? He says, snatch them from the fire. He's talking about lost people, right? So what, are, what is our job as dual citizens? Our ultimate goal is we're going to be in heaven that's our citizenship. But while I'm here, I'm going to do everything I can to win people to Jesus so that they can move with me one day. Right? How many know it's not any fun to move and leave people behind? It's not fun. I did it. I moved from Alabama. When I got into Utah, I think I cried for 20 miles up the road because I left my family and I'm just sitting there. I'm broken for it. Think about that in, in heavenly terms. One day when Jesus Christ comes back and the skies split open and the rapture of the church takes place and we leave people behind, that's heartbreaking. Knowing that they won't go with us. That's what he's saying. He's saying we have to bring a little bit of understanding that we want them to be citizens with us. There's a mindset that has to be present for Sunday success. Each Monday, our staff comes together. We spend about an hour of prayer right here in this room to kick our week off. It's not anything crazy. It's not a bunch. Of, but we do that so that our mindsets will get right for the week. It's the first fruits. It's the first thing we do. Let's meet up here. Let's just pray. We're just praying together, reading the words, you know, wherever in this room, in this church you want to move to. But just set aside this time. It's important to get our minds right. Each one of us still has private times of prayer. Talking about staff. Prayer, study, that kind of stuff. But when we do this corporately, it helps us all be, as Paul says, of one mindset. That's why we have prayer and worship nights. Everybody comes together so we can get on one mindset. That's why we come on Sunday morning so we can worship together. We can pray together and be one mindset for the glory of God and for the advancement of the kingdom. Paul talks about that. Sundays are a preparation for the week ahead. Corporately. To help us be in one accord. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. All right. So there are also things I want to challenge you, some practical things, uh, for you to get ready for Sundays. All right? I'm not talking about dress codes. I'm not going to talk about what to wear or anything like that. But the first thing we do is we set a standard. I want to encourage you to set a standard of expectation. Set a standard of expectation. People usually decide on Saturday whether they're going to attend church on Sunday. That's a Saturday decision. 
You don't just wake up in the morning and go, ooh, I'm going to church. No, you've probably talked about it on Saturday or Saturday night. And say, well, I'm doing this this weekend, so I don't know if I can make it. This may not be important. Listen, what you prioritize becomes important to you. I'm going to tell you this. Adults, parents in the room, what you prioritize becomes a priority to your kids too. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but I'm going to tell you this. If church is not a priority to you, it will be non-existent to your kids. So we have to be careful. Decide on Saturday. Make that decision and stick to it. And when Sunday morning comes, bring an expectation with you. I'm not going to church for my health. I'm going to church so that I can meet face-to-face with God. That's what my expectation is. I expect something. It begins with each of us. Think about revival, awakening, renewal, whatever you want to call it. Whatever you label it, it will always start with your heart. Your heart individually. Bringing expectation to church with you will allow the power of God to operate in your life. Secondly, make church a lifestyle. Make Sundays a lifestyle. And go back to the Bible Belt. I'm Southern. I have to talk about it. You, go and you, you can go to Walmart anywhere in Alabama and you can say, hey, are you a Christian? Try it if you're ever down there. This is what the answer you get. I go to church. I didn't ask you if you went to church. I asked you if you're a Christian. But the answer is I go to church. Why? Because that is a priority. Doesn't mean they're living for Jesus. It just means they go to church. They set that side, uh, that time. That's why we're called the Bible Belt, right? That's because that is the first thing we do. Now, I understand it's a little different up here. I get that, and it's taken me 11 years to figure that out. But we need to make Sundays a lifestyle. Church is a lifestyle choice. Can you be a Christian and not attend church? Yes. Is that beneficial for you? No. No. It's not. Why? Because of what Hebrews says when it says, don't forsake the gathering of believers. Don't forsake this, this moment to come together and be with like-minded people in the room. Share your your hearts with each other. Let people pray with you. Let, Let people encourage you. That's what church is. That's why we're the body of Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. If I'm going to go through things, but I never form a relationship with people in the church, then I will go through that thing alone and not be able to blame anybody for it. See what I'm saying? So, prioritize and expect and watch what God does in you and in your family. So let's get back on track. Number three, uh, it was what, what do you desire? Worship. Number four, destiny. Where are you going? Where are you going? We've seen our walk, right? A contrast in two ways of walking. How do you live? Mindset, what do you think? Worship, what do you desire? These things, you see this pattern that Paul's talking about. And then finally, we come to this destiny thing. Where are you going? There are two possible destinies in this passage. For those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, which we talked about last week, Paul says, and he says it with tears in his eyes, like Whitfield, George Whitfield, who could not preach on hell without weeping. George Whitfield made that comment. He said, I cannot preach a message on hell without weeping. And it was because he was thinking about all those people that are going to miss heaven. With tears in his eyes, he says their end is destruction. The word destruction means ruined. It means wasted. Paul is saying that if you live as an enemy of the cross of Christ, the end result is a life of ruin. It's wasted. It's garbage. That's, that's pretty harsh if you think about it. These words he's using, it's like, wow, you're calling people garbage. He's saying your life is garbage if you don't know Jesus. Now that off- that's offensive. That offends some people. Because some people have great lives without Christ in it. Right? I mean, let's, let's face it. You have billionaires. They get anything they want to. They can do anything they want to do in the world. They can buy anything they want to buy. They're hollow without Jesus. And in scriptures earlier than this, you see Paul talk about it's all rubbish. It's all rubbish. It's all trash compared to knowing Christ. Paul is saying that if you live as an enemy of the Christ, the end result is a life of ruin. See, sin reduces you. It strips you of humanity so that you are formed by the sin instead of formed and shaped by Christ. And it ruins the soul. If you look at somebody who's been living in the world for a long time, I know somebody like this, and uh, I'm not going to share a lot about him, but I know somebody like this. He was, in, um, he was actually in ministry with me a long time ago, probably 25, 26 years ago. And uh, some point, something happened 
where he completely turned his back on God. And he is pro everything that is anti God. <laughs> Does that make sense? He, he, he's all about everything. Complete, he, he's almost to that atheistic place. And I'm thinking about, I think about him, and I'm thinking about, wow, his life is in ruin right now. And what has happened is, it only takes one sinful thing to, to allow you, for you to allow to seep into your life before you start becoming like that. Sin transforms you. The power of God transforms you. So there's always this battle. That's why, that's why I believe it was Paul that said, uh, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities of darkness. Because Why? Because they're both fighting for your soul. God loves you, and the devil hates anything God loves. So he wants to destroy whatever God loves. So he's going to come after you. Because I believe, believe me in this, if Jesus is running after you, the devil's running after you too. So we're always in this constant place. That's why the word is so important. That's why letting it sink deep in our souls is so important. So what about those who are in Christ? Because, see, that's the first thing he talks about. This, their end is destruction for those who are enemies of the cross. What's our destiny? Transformation. That's our destiny. Not destruction, but transformation. Look at verses 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Transformation and glory. That's the destination of a believer. Notice how Paul says this. He says that when, when, when Christ comes... What he's going to do is transform this lowly body, this vile body, to use the language of the King James Version, the vile, he recognizes that redemption is not complete yet. We haven't received complete redemption this side of heaven because there's sin in the world. And redemption would be a complete separation, full redemption would. So what he's he's alluding to here is he's saying our citizenship in heaven, we're going to be there, and the, the, the... reward for that is not only Jesus, but it's transformation and glory, full transformation. Now, he recognizes that we still carry this mortal frame that is tainted with sin and with flesh. We're all messed up. Our bodies are messed up, right? We all have aches and pains, and the older you get, the worse they get, right? I think somebody somebody made a joke to me one time. It's like, the older you get, the more noises you make when you get up. I'm like, I'm dreading that, you know? And I'm like, I'm 46 years old, and I stand up, and I, my knees pop, and I, my back creaks and everything else. I'm like, what is going on? You're dying. That's what's going on. Right? Let's be honest. We are all dying. This side of heaven, we all will die. But man, one day we're going to be transformed and this vile body that we have right now is going to be in glory forever as citizens of heaven. But we have work to do here first. He's saying there's coming a day when that's no longer going to be the case. You're going to be changed. You're going to be transformed. That is your destiny if you know Jesus. Transformation is available to those who are in Christ, who do not make themselves enemies of the cross, but who follow that path who follow that way, and who live as Paul describes in this passage. Listen, Christian in the room, listen for a minute. If you embrace the cross, the cross for your justification and forgiveness, and the cross as the path of discipleship, as you follow Jesus, if you will do that, then you will be shaped and formed in the image of Christ, and the glory and transformation will be your destiny. But you have to make that decision. You have to decide. Listen to these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll close with this. Paul says this, Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed, transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, And the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. There's a lot of talk about being changed and transformed. As a believer who's seeking God, are you being transformed now? But our complete transformation will happen on the other side of this life. We are being transformed. 
If you know Jesus, listen, the more, the more you get in the word, the more you pray, the more you get together with other believers and encourage one another, it's all food for your soul. And it's all a transformation process that takes place. I could not have, I mean, yeah, obviously the cross and Jesus and death and resurrection, all that stuff is number one. But I don't think I could have grown in my relationship with God without other people. I, I had to get involved and get discipled somehow. I had to be involved in something. So it's very important. This is why life is so hard at sometimes. It's why we don't understand everything. But one day we will. When that final transformation takes place in the eternal presence of God, we will understand all things. The Bible says we'll know all things. If you don't know Jesus, transformation in heaven won't happen for you. Only destruction, as Paul writes, for your family members, for your friends, for your neighbors. If they don't know Jesus, transformation in glory will not take place for them. Their end is destruction. See, this should spark something inside of us to say, my neighbor that don't know Christ, I've got to lead them there. I've got to share the gospel with them. If you're in this room, you've got to make a decision. You don't have a choice. You've got to make a decision. I don't care if you got saved when you were six years old. Are you living for Jesus now? If you said a little cute little prayer when you were a kid, I'm not saying that I'm not taking away from the importance of that, but I am saying, look, now are you still living for Jesus? If you're not, then you might want to reconsider things. You might want to rethink some things. You might want to look at yourself again. Make a decision to join in the journey of transformation. Life may not get easier, but it's a lot easier walking through it with Jesus than it is by yourself. You have to decide. Your neighbors have to decide. Your family members have to decide. We all, by ourselves, have to decide if we're going to follow Christ or not. And why is he talking about a salvation mess? It just sounds like it turned into a salvation mess. It sort of did, but we got to go through Scripture, and that's what Paul's talking about right now. And it's encouraging because the church is so important today. This time in our life, this day and age, and what's going on in the world, the church is very important. And if the church don't man up or woman up, to be correct, right, let's be then the church is going to continue to just fall by the wayside. I don't think the church will ever die, but I'm going to tell you right now, if we want to see a renewal or an awakening take place in our country, the church has to start. The church has to rise up. And how to do that is to challenge people, all of us, to do an evaluation of our own souls and see where we're at with Christ. Are you just living a passive Christian life? I'll go to church when I want to, or, or I don't really read the Word. I couldn't tell you what Scripture says, or I, I don't know anything about it. Then you're walking on dangerous territory. And I'm speaking from that experience right there. I know what it's like to walk in the dangerous territory of, I'm just not going to read, I'm not going to pray, but I'm going to act like it. And then actually doing it and watching it transform your life. It's important that we understand that. So if you're here today, if you're here this morning, said I don't have a relationship with Jesus, I haven't made that decision, or maybe I did when I was four years old and I don't remember it, but I sure haven't been living for Jesus all these years. This is what we do here. We, we say this a good bit. If we don't know, we can't help you grow. Right? What does that mean? If we don't know that you're making a decision to follow Jesus, we can't help you grow. And then you go back to if, you're, if you live alone or you're, you're by yourself and you never interact with people, then you can't blame other people for your issues that you're going through, that you're going through alone, right? So if you make that decision today, if you say today, hey, listen, pastor, I just need to know Jesus. I need to make my life right today and I need to make that decision. This is my challenge for you. Take one of those cards. Pastor Best going to talk about it in just a minute. We talk about it every week. Take one of those cards and write down, I need to change. I need Jesus. Help, whatever you got to say. I don't care what you put on it. Just put on there salvation for me today, something. Because we want to help you grow in that relationship with God. Now listen, there's no magical formula to getting saved. 
This is the way it works. Excuse me for a minute. This is the way it works. Say in your heart, I need a Savior. I'm lost without Jesus. You recognize I'm lost without Jesus. And today I need, I need that. And if you say that in your heart today and you mean it, the Bible says you're a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. Just like that. In an instant. But you have to make that decision. And your next step would be what we're doing next week, water baptism. And what's the next step after that? Get involved in our D1 class. We've spent, sent almost, I think, 20-something people through it in the last couple months. Through discipleship. Just get discipleship. Then get involved in a group. All this stuff is available, but if we don't know, we can't help you grow. So I want to encourage you today, take one of those Connect cards. If that's you, you say, I made that decision today. And let us know about it so we can hook you up and get you plugged in to the right places so that you can start watching that transformation take place in your life. Amen. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I just ask you today, God, to help. The most powerful prayer I can think of right now is help. Help us. Help us to give our lives over to you fully. To not play games with church. Not play games with with a relationship with God, but Lord, to get serious about it as we evaluate our own hearts. Are we serious about it? Because God, we don't want our lives to end in destruction. God, we want to be transformed by the power of God every day. So Lord, I pray for those in this room that may be making that decision right now. Maybe they're thinking, their, their heart's beating really fast. They're saying, maybe I should make this decision and they can't figure it out. Lord, speak to them. This is the spoken voice of God to make that decision now Lord I pray for every one of us Lord who we struggle through life sometimes the hard things come God we're so thankful that we have you to walk through it with us Lord I pray for every person in this church God I pray blessing over them God I pray power of God in their life Lord as we get ready for school to begin just a few weeks, Lord, I pray over those kids, the parents, Lord, and the teachers and administrations, God. I pray, Lord, protection over them. God, may they take Jesus to their schools. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about our church or give to our ministry, please visit our website at Bethel.ag.